So let's cover some basic heat pump diagnostic scenarios. In this scenario, it's working perfectly fine in air conditioning mode. But once we go to heating mode, we start tripping the high pressure switch. So there's several possibilities we have. Working good in AC, but in heat pump mode, we're tripping the high pressure switch. Let's go through those possibilities. Number one, let's el eliminate the easy stuff first. Is it too warm outside? I've had people try to check heat pumps in the summer or in the spring when it's above 80 degrees outside, and there's so much heat out there affecting this evaporator coil that it causes that pressure to rise, and the house is already warm, so we're not getting rid of that heat, so all your pressures are elevated, and you can definitely trip that high pressure switch in a heat pump mode working when it's too warm. So that one's pretty easy to identify. Hey, it's just too warm outside. And a lot of manufacturers will have a limit on what they want you to test it at. And usually it's like 70 degrees is like the highest they want you running that heat pump outside. But check with that particular manufacturer. Second scenario, and this is a big one, is the airflow across the indoor coil. You may have just enough airflow in air conditioning mode for it not to have a noticeable problem. Now note, it's still gonna be a problem because if you don't have enough airflow, we're not boiling this refrigerant from a liquid to a vapor, and we're probably getting liquid refrigerant going back to a compressor, causing long-term compressor damage. It won't be immediate, but it's starting to take the life out of the compressor. It's starting to wash the oil away from the bearings and the oil away from the moving parts in the compressor, and eventually it's gonna start freezing up and you're gonna have issues. Now, those are problems, but the customer may have never noticed it. Airflow issues, but now we go in the heating mode, and we're sitting in that high temperature, high pressure superheated vapor, to the indoor coil. And we're trying to get all that heat rejected in a much smaller coil, which means we need the most amount of airflow we can get across that coil so that we don't have a problem. In other words, that airflow gets restricted. I can't get the heat away from the coil fast enough. Because I can't get the heat away, the temperature is gonna go up and therefore the pressure is gonna go up. And when that pressure is gonna go up, it's gonna go up all the way back over here and we're gonna be tripping our high pressure switch. So airflow is critical. And a lot of people look at, hey, the filter's clean. That's not enough. Is the filter even big enough? A lot of people try to put a thick filter under the factory spot that's too small and it causes a restriction. So sometimes that good filter that's thick is good, but we want it to be in a larger area. Maybe we need a transition. Maybe the return air ductwork is too small. Maybe the, the number of filters is too small. Maybe there's something in that return air ductwork. Maybe the blower's on the wrong speed or the blower wheel's dirty. Maybe this indoor coil over here is completely clogged up or it's dirty or even a little bit of dirt or dirt's hidden between the fins and it's preventing heat transfer. Maybe our supplier ductwork is too small or there's too many vents closed or insulation came loose or, or, or there's a whole list of things that could be. But if I'm not getting enough airflow across that indoor coil, we can't get the heat off of that coil pressure and temperature builds up and that's going to be an issue. When I get calls about this, I'm always asking what is the airflow in CFM, measured CFM across this indoor coil to know that we can eliminate that. So there's two scenarios. Let's look at the third one. Let's look at something mechanical in the refrigeration system. So we hook our gauges up and we see that our high pressure is obviously maxing out because that's what's tripping the high pressure switch. But we check our low pressure over here at our true suction line and we see our low pressure is really low, like super low. It's down close to zero or, or something very low. And we see that we know we have a restriction. Something really big going on because our high pressure is maxed out and we check our suction pressure and it's down pegged at the other side. So let's see what's happening. Why would that work in air conditioning mode, but all of a sudden now we have a restriction in heating mode. And the first thing I look for after airflow is I start looking over at the metering device at the indoor coil. Now that's gonna be important because notice in air conditioning mode, we're sending liquid refrigerant this way, we're metering, everything's working fine. But we go into heating mode, now we're sending hot gas to the indoor coil and it's coming down back through a liquid through that metering device that metering device should be bypassed, allowing it to bypass it like it's not even there. A fixed orifice is gonna move that little piston out of the way, but there could still be something clogging it up there, or that little screen right past that fixed orifice could get clogged up, and that's causing a restriction. And now all of a sudden, we have a pressure drop here. When we get to our metering device outside, we have another pressure drop here, and then all of a sudden, their low pressure tanks out. So that's gonna be one issue. Let's look at a TXV. A TXV, we have two options, an internal or an external bypass. A lot of times TXVs now are internal bypass, meaning when we're in heating mode, it allows internally that valve to open and it allows that liquid refrigerant to bypass through that TXV like it's not even there. If you had a sight glass, you'd have a full clear sight glass. 
But if that little check valve gets clogged up from oxidation, the copper shavings, debris left in that system, that little check valve will be stuck closed. It will not allow it to bypass and all the refrigerant is trying to go through that little metering port of the TXV. So now all of a sudden you have a pressure drop across here another pressure drop at your outdoor metering device, your suction pressure tanks and your head pressure spikes. Next thing you know, you're tripping on a high pressure switch. And not just high pressure switch, but probably you're gonna overheat that compressor pretty quick too. So in that case, we wanna make sure that we either clean that TXV, take it apart and get it clean, or we're gonna replace that TXV. Now I wanna note that a lot of people blame that TXV first, but notice in this scenario, it wasn't that the TXV failed it was contamination in that system that clogged up those moving parts in the TXV. So it wasn't its fault to the fact that the system was dirty and contaminated. So we wanna keep that in mind. If we have that issue, we wanna make sure we clean up that system so we don't have that same problem on the new metering device we're putting in there. Now, a lot of systems, especially the older TXVs and commercial systems, you get the eight ton TXVs, they do not have that internal bypass. And some of the older TXVs also had an external check valve piping that literally went around that TXV to make it like it's not even there. So in air conditioning mode, that check valve closes and with all of our liquid refrigerant meters through that metering device. But we get to heat pump mode and that check valve opens and the refrigerant goes around that metering device like it's not even there. If that check valve sticks closed, now the liquid refrigerant cannot bypass that metering device and we'll start to see that we have a pressure drop on this side. And that pressure drop is going to tell us we have something going on here or maybe even at our liquid line filter dryer, but we want to check this. A friend of mine recently called me about a commercial system and we had an issue with that TXV inside working great in AC mode and heat pump mode, the suction pressure tanked. We checked the pressure in this line, it ended up being low pressure instead of high pressure like it's supposed to be. And we found out we had an issue with the metering device, but it wasn't just that they don't make commercial systems with the internal bypass. So we had to literally add in an external check valve around it so it operate normally in the heat pump mode. And they do sell those separately so you can add those into it. So that's the things we're looking for. Now an easy way to check for that is if we actually check what our liquid pressure is going to be. Now this does not work on a carrier, Bryant or Payne system because they literally put their metering device right at the service port. So your service port where you're checking your pressure is gonna be over here on this side. But if it's not one of those, or if it is one of those with a service port on this side, which I like to do, we can put our high pressure gauge right there on the liquid line. And we should be high pressure. It'll be a lower pressure than what it is on the hot gas line, but it should still be high pressure. So if you hook up your gauge on that actual liquid line in heating mode, and you see that you have low pressure there, the problem's gonna be somewhere before that gauge. So if we go back, we can see, hey, let's check our filter dryer. Let's check our metering device. Let's check our bypass check valve. Something on this side is clogging up and that's what we're having a problem with. So being able to check what our pressure is here is gonna be very important. And we can also do subcooling here. We can see, hey, our subcooling and we have high pressure and the proper amount of subcooling feeding this metering device. I don't have to worry about a problem on this side. I know that my suction pressure is too low here and I'm feeding the right amount of subcooling, plenty of pressure to my metering device here. We can start looking at this metering device. Maybe the screen before this metering device is clogged up. Maybe the metering device itself is clogged up. Maybe the metering device isn't working. Maybe there's a problem with it. TXVs, maybe somebody let that transmission tube for the sensing bulb touch and rub against and it rubbed a hole in it and it leaked the charge. So now we're having a restriction here. And carrier like to use these AccuTrack, I can't remember the name of it, but there's like these little bitty metering devices for their package units. Instead of having one metering device feeding the outdoor coil, we'll have five or six or seven or eight or 10 different little bitty metering devices feeding the outdoor coil. And those metering devices, especially the ones at the bottom can get clogged up. And there's little tricks about how you can fix that, but it's another scenario. It may also be a restriction inside the outdoor coil. A lot of coils now are micro channel, very, very small channels. So if somebody's not brazing with the nitrogen flow or not keeping those lines clean, any of that contamination will clog up those little micro channel tubes and it doesn't allow the refrigerant to flow through that outdoor coil. And now we have a restriction. And instead of boiling the refrigerant from a liquid of vapor absorbing heat, it becomes a restriction. Our suction pressure drops and our head pressure builds. Next thing you know, you're out there for a service call. You put it in AC mode and there's just enough refrigerant flowing through there because the outdoor temperature is low enough that in AC mode, it tends to be working. 
you go back to heat pump mode and now it's not working. So that's usually the rare side, but it's becoming more of an issue with microchannel systems. And we also have the factor of being overcharged. Technicians will use these shortcuts or these rules of thumb that were passed down from one technician to another technician to another technician. And these shortcuts seem to work in the short term, but in the long term, they don't see the effects of what it's doing to the compressor or the efficiency of that whole entire system. Now, when you get to heating mode and you reverse that cycle, now these problems become an issue very quickly. In heat pump mode, it typically uses less refrigerant than it does in air conditioning mode. Well, now that we're overcharged, there's nowhere for that extra refrigerant to go. This indoor coil is much smaller, so now this is acting as the condenser. That refrigerant starts flooding this indoor condenser, and the pressure starts building on this high side, and that back pressures all the way back up to the outdoor unit, where that high pressure switch is going to trip. Now, some manufacturers install things such as charge compensators to allow for that difference in charge, but that's still no excuse to overcharge the system. I've seen people that saw a charge compensator, so they went ahead and added more refrigerant because it had the charge compensator, which then defeats the purpose of the charge compensator altogether. So making sure that we install the system correctly in the summertime, that we charge it correctly in AC mode, is gonna be critical for how it works in the heat pump mode. It's always more difficult to charge a system in the heating mode because it needs less refrigerant. A lot of time it results to having to take all the charge out and then weigh that charge back in, take into account the length of the line set. So it can be much more difficult to charge that system in heating mode, which is why we wanna make sure we use the correct manufacturer recommendations, the correct superheat and subcooling when we're charging in AC mode. Just a quick recap, put a pressure gauge on that liquid line and see where our pressure is. If we have low pressure, on the liquid line, should always be liquid no matter what mode it's in, and we do not have high pressure there, we're gonna go back this way. We're gonna look at our filter dryer. We're gonna look at our metering device. We're gonna look at that bypass. We're gonna look at something on this side to see what's causing that issue. If we do have high pressure there and we have subcooling here, then we're gonna look on this side of it. We're gonna be looking at that metering device for the outdoor, the screen for it, or maybe even if there's a micro channel, if there's some kind of an issue with this coil. But again, we're talking about checking the pressure on this liquid line. If it's a carrier, you gotta be careful that you make sure that you have an extra port on this liquid line to do that, because if you're using the factory port, it's actually gonna be here and it's always gonna be measuring low pressure. So it's a great service tool. Unfortunately, one brand has to make it a little bit more difficult for checking, but you can add a service port to any one of those systems right outside and that helps you with the diagnostics. Hopefully this gives you a little help. It doesn't cover every possible scenario, but it's some of the main ones and you're using this refrigeration cycle as a service tool to be able to diagnose the system.